G'day fellas and welcome to another Age of Empires 4 video. Today we're going to be looking at all the brand new landmarks that were added in with the Sultan's Ascent expansion pack. Where will your favorite landmark land? That's going to be the question. It's going to be through S tier to D tier. Let's start it off with the Japanese and we'll be going through next up with the Byzantines. And then finally with Juicy's Legacy followed by Order of the Dragon and then the Ayubids coming in last. So if you want to skip ahead to one of them, there'll be links down in the description to where you can find them. So... Starting off with Japan's first landmark, the Kuro Storehouse. I'm a big fan of this landmark, uh, and I think that this is a very solid early game landmark. This is going to be going in the A tier. Uh, so if, if you're unfamiliar with the mechanics of the, the landmark, I'll just give you a quick rundown. Every 45 seconds, it gives you farms around the landmark. Uh, and then as a result, or then at the end of that, uh, you're going to have, I think it's uh, 45 wood every minute or 75 wood every minute. I'm not sure exactly what the number is, but the main reason we're getting it is for those farms. And this has got great synergy with the civilization bonuses for the Japanese and allows you to play a really nice pocket economy in the base, allows you to transition to a farm economy. And one of the things that you uh, get with this landmark is you never fall into the trap where you run out of food and you're kind of stuck there twiddling your thumbs going, oh no, I've run out of food. You know, I've got no deer, I've got no berries, I've got no sheep, I've got nothing I can go to. You've always got this as a backup and it's a really safe landmark. And that's why I think it sits in the A tier. Next up, we're going to be having the uh, the, the Coca. Let me let me just uh, <laughs> get, get my reference sheet right here. That's You can see how often I, I play this landmark, the Coca Township. So the Coca Township, the other feudal age landmark, gives you access to the Shinobi. If you don't get this landmark, uh, or if you, if you don't uh, use this landmark, you won't be able to access the Shinobi. I think at the moment, this is still a very undiscovered landmark. Uh, and for that reason, I'm going to be putting it in the B tier. I think that this is a, a complex landmark as well, which means that um, the more that you practice with the landmark, the better that you'll get with it. I think that there's going to be really nice circumstances where you can use the Shinobi. Uh, as an example, if you're playing up against Siege, you're going to be able to just uh, Shun Shin or Shin Shun on top of the Siege and be able to take it out. But it is not going to be as safe as something like the Kura Storehouse. It's going to be a huge investment uh, to go into this landmark, and you're really going to have to try and make it work. And already we've seen people come up with very simple counters, like just a single outpost on a gold mine is more than enough that, that, to counter it. So, Because you can shunshin in, but then you can't shunshin out. So it, it, it makes it very difficult to do. Uh, so next up we're going to do... Uh, I, once again, I don't know the name of this landmark just because I don't use it. So it's called the Temple of Equality. Uh, so this one, it unlocks the Buddhist Monk for 33% cheaper and weakens. Now, the way that it weakens is that it's like a targetable spell. Uh, it's got no cooldown on it except for a GCD, which is about one second. Uh, that's a global cooldown. Uh, and it's 50%, uh, which is a pretty significant amount. But the main reason you'd be going for it, in my opinion, is because of the 50, or the 20% bonus damage that you get when you cast a conversion uh, so that means that you have to be holding a relic, and that means that you have to be standing nearby. So the way I would picture it is, you know, you've got a whole bunch of ranged units, and then you, you look to go into the fight, and you cast your Wallalols on the back, and then it boosts up all, all the damage. I could see that working, definitely. Uh, the reality is that that's a very niche set of circumstances, uh, and I don't know if I can really justify it. Once again, it's one of those landmarks where it's like, it, it's a bit of a risk compared to the other landmark, and because of that... It's going to have to sit down in the C tier at the moment. So definitely, uh, I wouldn't recommend people go for this landmark. I'd instead recommend people go for uh, this one right here, uh, which is going to be all about the Yoroshiro. And once again, this is called the Floating Gate. And I apologize for not knowing the names of all of these landmarks. I know what they do. Uh, I just don't know what their names are because it's just like, I just click that one. That's the one I go for. So Floating Gate is going to be our very first S tier landmark. This landmark is the landmark that just keeps on giving throughout the game. The way that it works is simple. Every four minutes, you get one of these little bad boys down here. I don't know if you can see them. Uh, and they're going to be... It's like a relic, basically. You can choose which building you want to put it into. Uh, it, it's called a Yoroshiro. And it spawns in every four minutes. So for me, I like to just put them in Forges, which is the unique blacksmith mining camp replacement uh, building. And that just gives you 75 gold. So basically, as soon as you get to Castle Age, you get two of these, these out of the gate. So two relics. And then every four minutes after that, you've got another relic. So if we imagine, say, you got up to Castle Age, let's say you did a fast castle, you got up at eight minutes. At the 20 minute mark, you're going to have five relics worth of gold generation income into your into your stockers, into your stockers, into your coffers, uh, over your enemy. And that's on top of relics, because keep in mind that it unlocks the Shinto Priest, uh, which you'll be able to bring in uh, with relics as well. So it's an incredibly good landmark. And the other thing is that it scales. The longer the game goes, the better it gets for you. And you can also customize the resources that you want. Do you want wood instead? Okay, well, great. You can just put it in a lumber camp instead. And now you, you're getting wood generation instead of gold. Uh, you can't do stone. So I guess that's one of the the, uh, the shortfalls of it, but it's still pretty damn good. All right, so next up, we've got the Castle of the Crow. So the Castle of the Crow is a unique keep 
landmark for the Japanese. And it's not just your ordinary, not just your ordinary keep. Uh, this one, it's a bit curious. So it spawns in a trader and the trader provides a huge amount of resources, but it does it every five minutes. The problem is that the trader can be denied. And my thinking is, if I know that my enemy goes for a Castle of the Crow, I've got two options. Number one, I can just kill the Castle of the Crow. Or number two, I can just prevent them from getting that trader spawn. Because the trader always has to come in from a trading post, with the exception of maps that don't have a trade post. Uh, they actually spawn in the middle of the map, would you believe? Um, and then they walk back to the Castle of the Crow. But essentially, this can be denied. So th this is a landmark that generates economic value. However, the economic value can be denied. So I think that this landmark, when you compare it to the other landmark, it's the exact same case of our Castle Age landmarks, where it's just one of those, like, don't get me wrong, I think this is a decent landmark. But at the end of the day, I feel like it is in inferior uh, to the, the other landmark that's available. And the fact that it can be counted means that it will sit in the BTR. All right, finally, for the Japanese, it's going to be the Taganashima Gunsmith. This landmark allows you to purchase the Ozutsu unit, uh, which is at this stage in the game going to get a nerf. I can tell you that. It's way too good. It's way too strong. AoE ranged gunpowder unit. It's just too damn good. It can kill buildings in one shot. It's amazing. Uh, and the the, uh, the point I want to make here is that we're talking about uh, value that is generated um, and versus value that is random. So with the Castle of the Crow, I'm not saying that the, the value is random, but just the outcome is going to be random because it generates a caravan for you and you may get that caravan or you may not get that caravan depending on what your enemy does. When it comes to the Taganashima Gunsmith, you are always going to be getting that. You're always going to be getting the tickets, the stockpile that come in. So it produces a stockpile every 30 seconds uh, and that stockpile can be used to produce a unit. Uh, and one of those units is the Ozutsu, which is the unit that we're going to be focusing on here. And you can see that it costs a total of, of 240 resources. And we get a ticket every 30 seconds, which means that this landmark is producing 480 resources every minute at the Imperial Age. That's an impressive amount of resources. It's guaranteed. And on top of that, it deploys these units instantly. You just click the button and the unit is spawns immediately. And if you don't want the Ozutsu, you can go to the Bombard, you can go to the Baldequin, you can go to the Hand Cannon here for whatever reason you'd want to do it instead of the Ozutsu. Uh, but this landmark is definitely, in my opinion, an STR landmark. So there you go. That's the Japanese landmarks. Those are the ones that you should be going for, at least in the current meta. But just remember, and I should provide this caveat right now, uh, even though I'm a Conqueror 3 player, I'm not the best player in the game. I'm sure that uh, people at the top level, Marine Lord, uh, Luciferon, Beastie, they're going to have different opinions from me. And that's okay because we're still quite early on in this expansion pack and the meta has developed in a certain way, but it will continue to evolve as we go. And by the same token, at your level, your games may play out differently and you might think, well, Jonko, you know, the, the, the Cura storehouse is absolutely terrible. It should be D tier. And that's okay. We're, we're allowed to have different opinions. All right. So next up, we're going to be doing the Byzantine landmarks. So we're going to start it off with the Grand Winery. This is a landmark that I thought out of the gate, this landmark is great. Uh, it's wonderful. But then I, I did some testing on it and I said, wait a minute, that's not what I thought it would do. So what this landmark does is it's basically got two aspects. Well, I guess you could really argue three and they come all game. And I like that. But at the same time, I don't like that. Let me explain why. With this landmark, let's, uh, let's go out and we'll grab the Byzantines. So the first aspect is that you have access to... Um, and I, I will just apologize in advance because if you're not interested in the Byzantines, I encourage you to skip ahead because I'm going to go quite in detail with my analysis of these landmarks and why I think they go where. So um, when it comes to the Byzantines, you've got access to different mercenary contracts. It's a pretty important part of the way that you play early on. So as an example, my favorite is the Eastern Mercenary Contract, just because the more Kashyyyk you've got, the more units that can take advan advantage of Triumph. Uh, so I, I'm a big fan of Kashyyyk and it costs 400 um, olive oil to get the Kashyyyk in. And when you have your starting berries, you start off with six berries or six berry bushes, and that is 1500 food, which gives you a total of 750 olive oil. Now that 750 olive oil is not enough to buy two sets of Kashyyyk. However, if you get a grand winery, it takes that 750 olive oil up to 1200, which all of a sudden enables you to not only get the second pair of Kashyyyk, but the third pair of Kashyyyk as well. So that's your early game bonus. It allows you to, to leverage your olive oil out of berry bushes and gives you that bonus. The mid game bonus is that you have a, a, uh, a, a landmark that acts as a monastery, which is nice, right? Like, it, okay, I didn't have to make a monastery. Wonderful. It means I can get my relics a little bit faster. Uh, when it comes to the fact that, that the winery generates olive oil instead of generating um, instead of, re of generating gold when you've got relics inside, I don't really like that. But, you know, it's, it's good that you can train your... Um, your monks from inside. So that, that's not too bad. And then the final bonus of it is that it provides a very slight increase to the amount of olive oil you drop off 
for the farms around it. Look, at the end of the day, it's 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 decent, um, but it's it's not going to be particularly impactful. Over, over the course of like 10 minutes, it might be impactful, uh, but o over the course of like a minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, it, you really won't notice it. So because of that, as we finally get to the end of it, I'm going to put it in the C tier. And that's simply because... Uh, you know what? Actually, I'm going to change it. I'm going to put it in the A tier because... Oh, no, I can't. I can't. It's got to be in the, in the B tier. Did I say C tier first? It's, anyway, B, B tier. We'll go in the B tier because to me, this landmark is the jack of all trades, the master of none. And sometimes it can work. Sometimes it doesn't. And for me, at least in the current meta with the fact that TCs have been nerfed recently and you don't really go into farms that early, uh, it, I can't justify putting it any higher. I think that if... if the meta changed to the point where, like, we saw two TC Bism teams always going, um, and you know, you, you'd always. The, if if the meta develops back into two TCs, this landmark will be really strong. I'll say that much, because you'll go for two TCs, you'll go for lots of olive groves, and you'll look to try and take advantage of, of a, a big mid game economy at like the twenty minute mark. At the moment, though, I think you're just gonna die <laughs> if you try and go for a second TC early. All right, that that's the the grand winery. Let's talk about the Imperial Hippodrome, which is incredible this landmark single-handedly can carry the byzantine to victory in so many matchups this landmark let, let's just uh, go over it a little bit so it acts as a stable that's the first thing uh contains the triumph ability and that's the big thing the triumph ability that can be activated with supply points now you start with supply points with this landmark but you get a supply point every 30 seconds and it just kind of chills out right so if you if you use triumph you lose all your supply points and then every 30 seconds after that you'll get a supply point and the way that it works is every supply point you've got it increases the duration of triumph what is triumph triumph is don't tell me it doesn't have it in here surely it does okay well, let me let me try my best to explain it uh so it is a an ability that increases your damage by four your movement speed by 10 percent, and your health regeneration by two every second uh which is pretty big because it means that if you've got say uh 30 tickets stacked up then that is 45 seconds and 45 seconds times two health regeneration is 90 health. So you can get really good value. You can take a fight, and if you micro well, you can get incredible value from those units. And that's part of the reason why I'm a big fan of going into Keshix, because that, that's two more units that can take advantage of Triumph. Uh, and it, it just helps you out a huge amount. So once again, I think that this landmark is going to be going in the S tier. Uh, it's an incredible landmark. And uh, it, it, it's uh, yeah, it's just a, a wonderful landmark that really keeps on giving you uh, throughout the game just, just constant ability to take your fights and win your fights. I think that the other thing to note is it's very flexible in that you can use it in team games. You can use it in 1v1. Uh, you can use it in the in the early game. You use it in, in the Feudal Age. Like I'll go for a raid. And then when I'm underneath the enemy's TC, I'll hit Triumph. Boom. And all of a sudden, my, my units are healing up and they're, they're doing a bit more attack and they're running faster to kill the villagers faster. Um, and then in the late game, you've got a whole bunch of cataphracts. Pop it, boom, there you go. Now they're all healing up, doing doing extra damage. They're faster. It's just, it's just such a wonderful landmark. All right, let's move on to the next one. So Assistant of the First Hill. I think this landmark is a bit of a niche landmark. I don't think that this landmark realistically has a place. Um outside of a very few shallow circumstances so this landmark acts as assistant that's the first thing uh which is you know it, it's not really that Im impressive it's like 250 300 stone something like that the main reason why you're going for this landmark is going to be for the bonus that it provides your units uh, and that is the ability to heal like crazy you can go from 200 and or you can increase your health by 20, 250 over 10 seconds which is huge the problem with this landmark is the balance. So I like the design aspect, and I think it makes a lot of sense, especially when it comes into fighting with units that have got a lot of health. So things like elephants, things like cataphracts, uh, even say your Varangian guards are, are, can be decent with the with uh, the pilgrim flask. The problem is that 45 seconds to regen a pilgrim flask is a really long time. So I'd, I'd like to see the, the balance of this changed, maybe reduce it down a little bit, because at the moment I couldn't justify giving this this landmark a, a rating above C tier. Um, I, I the the only viable strategy that I think that you can do this is if you rushed Castle Age, because if you're the, the best way to explain it is if you are going to Castle Age with the Byzantines, you should be doing that with five systems. And if you've got five systems, then you're going to maximize the bonus that you get from your Golden Horn Tower. However, if you're rushing Castle Age for whatever reason, 
you're not going to have those five systems because remember with the systems you're going to need an army to defend them because you've got to have them spread out so you can't just compact them all into a into a little base and have your five systems under your tc so you're not going to have that um so you, you can go for this landmark and it, it's about fighting with low numbers because all of a sudden I can turn a cataphract into a cataphract with 250 extra health and it means that my enemy is going to take that fight thinking they can take me or, t or take that fight uh, when in reality they can't and they're going to misjudge it and that's going to cause them to take a bad fight and then you can leverage that bad fight into a further advantage uh, and, and look to try and, and, and finish the game that way but I think on a, on a macro scale when you're talking about you know 30 40 units I don't think this landmark is going to make a significant difference when it comes to those big fights. Uh, and as a result, I think it sits down in the C tier. Next up is going to be the Golden Horn Tower. Now, I'd have to double check the math on this, but if I remember correctly, it works out to be the equivalent of 12 villages when you have a system, a level 5 system. So this landmark is S tier. That's an objective fact. Um, and let, let's talk a little... Actually, you know what? It's an A tier. Let me, let me, <laughs> that's not an, I love how I'm like, that's an objective fact. And then I just switch it because I just remembered one thing and I hate it about this landmark. And, it, and to be honest, if they change this one thing, they probably won't because it would be broken if they did. Uh, so the Golden Horn Tower, it periodically produces unlocked mercenary units for free. The value of units produced increases within a system's influence. So what does that mean exactly? Well, let's focus on the second part. The value of the units produced increases within a system's influence. So naturally, I looked at that and I said to myself, okay, so I should just build this within the influence of my system, right? And that's what I did. And it was just a level one system. And I was like, eh, the difference isn't that big. And then I had this thought, what if I built it in a level five system? Uh, and yeah, it's crazy. So I think you get more units uh, and you also get uh, the units come out faster as well. Um, and because of that, if you've got the level five system, it absolutely just pumps out units like crazy. The issue is you don't get to choose what units this this is going to make. If you go for Keshiks, like I do very often, uh, you'll want to you want to upgrade those pretty early on once you hit Castle Age. You want to look to try and uh, get the, where is it? Right here, the Mercenary uh, upgrade. Oh gosh, Trade Posts. Wait, where's the upgrade? It must be... Okay, it's not listed in the Mercenary House. There's a Veterancy upgrade uh, that allows all your Mercenaries to get to Veterancy. And when you do that, you unlock the second level of Mercenaries, which for the Eastern Mercenary contract is the Gulam. Uh, I don't know why the Keshik is not in, in the Feudal Age either. Oh, it's because because it's the Golden Horn Tower. Okay. Um, so it's it's the Gulam. And then the issue becomes that you are, instead of, before we were making, you know, Keshiks 100% of the time, but now we're making Keshiks and sometimes we're making Gulams and sometimes we're making Keshiks and sometimes we're making Gulams and we can't choose which one we want. And that's okay, but remember that our whole goal here is to maximize the efficiency we're getting from the Hippodrome. And Gulams aren't going to do that. Gulams are going to be great, but they're not going to do that. Uh, and because of that, that that single reason, the fact that you can't choose which uh, unit that you get from the uh, from the contract, that is the reason why it sits in the A tier rather than the S tier. If you could choose, then it would definitely be S tier because it would be broken as hell. Uh, and I can probably understand why they don't do why why they have limited it in that functionality. All right, so we've got our next landmark. I tell you what, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit worried here because all of the landmarks I'm rating, they all seem pretty high, all right? Like I'm giving a couple of S tiers here, but I, I'm feeling like this is pretty justified so far, right? Like the floating gate is really good. Infinite value on that. Uh, Tash Taganashima Gunsmith, another really good landmark. Instant units. Uh, then we've obviously got the, uh, the the Triumph ability here at the Imperial uh, uh, Hippodrome. Another good one. Uh, let's talk about, we've got uh, two of the Imperial Age landmarks that we can go for here. Uh, once again, I, I know that there's a big one and a small one, and we like the, the small one and not the big one. Uh, so it's the Foreign Engineering Company. So that's the small one right here. Foreign Engineering Company is a particularly interesting landmark because it allows you to harness the English. And what, what I mean by that is you can get units for free that cost gold. So the main thing that I'm looking at here is your nest of bees. I mean, it, all three of the units are viable, right? You, you can you have access to the nest of bees, the hui hui pao, and the royal cannon. All three of those units are very viable in the late game. Um, the, the main thing about it is is that it costs olive oil, and olive oil is a resource that is limited, uh, depending on how many farmers you've got, right? In in the in the late game, your main income is going to be from the farmers now we have seen a little bit of a trade progression coming through which we will get into i, I definitely think that there is going to be a um a byzantine trade meta that we will go through uh and there's going to be a lot of gold that comes in from that but there's also going to be a lot of 
Um, there's also going to be a lot of olive oil that comes in from that. So depending on how strong trade is, will also depend on the value of this landmark. Because if if we see like Byzantine players going for trade all the time, and it's really successful, and they're able to defend their trade routes, I suspect the Palatine school is probably going to be a bit stronger. Uh, whereas for the foreign engineering company, I think that if players mainly avoid trade, we're going to see this be really strong. Um, and let, let me explain why that is. Gold is an important resource. The longer the game goes, the less gold there is on the map. The fact that you can have olive oil and you can turn that olive oil into units that cost gold is incredible. And you can continue to do that. And that's a very powerful ability uh, to be able to do that. So that in, in itself is, is very, very nice. Um, the other thing to note is that uh, this landmark, you can put it within the uh, radius of a system and that's going to reduce the time it takes for these units to train. So, you know, 30 or uh, 63 seconds on a quick power looks really scary. Uh, but then remember, it's only 31 seconds when it's in the influence of a of a, um, of a a system. So it's, it's a really, really nice landmark to have. I think it's probably somewhere between the S and the A tier, but I'm pretty confident. I, I want to say S tier for this. But the thing, the, the one reason why I'm saying it might not be is just because, um, just because I don't know the direction the meta is going to go. As I said, like it, it could be that trade starts to take off and, and if trade is, is getting better, uh, then you're probably not going to see players use that as much. And it, it might seem counterintuitive because when you trade, you actually get a little bit of olive oil. So you've technically you've got more olive oil to spend and therefore because you've got more olive oil, you should be going for this. And that's probably an argument that you could make because it gives you access to the nest of B, which is just a really good unit to always have. Um, but then on top of that, you could just be spending that olive oil on your units and then spending your gold on your, your siege, you know, picking up your mangonels or, or your, your own cannons or your own bombards. So that, that's the other route. But we're going to, uh, you know, what? I'm just going to throw it in the S tier at the moment just because I gen genuinely think in the current meta, this is a an incredible landmark in the late game and it is what enables uh, Byzantine players just to, to carry in the late game so effectively. Um, it, can, I, can I just also say, just before we go uh, on this landmark, it also synergizes incredibly well uh, with the late game economy of the Byzantines. So what you want to be doing, so ideally Byzantines, 130 villages, uh, what you want to be doing is spamming out all of your trash units and your trash units just cost, like look at the Lamentani, right? 80 food, 10 wood. This thing is just literally food. So what are you doing with that food? That food's coming from olive groves. Where's that extra olive oil going? Well, you know where it's going. It's going straight back into your siege. So that's that's where it comes from. Uh, and I, I think it's definitely the right call to be going in, into a landmark like that. And then finery, finally, finery, uh, finally, we've got the Palatine School. At least I'll double check and make sure I've got that name correctly. Yeah, the Palatine School. So this is a landmark that initially I was apprehensive about. I'm like, yeah, look, it's cool, but it's 30% chance. There's no guarantee that it comes out. You know, you're going to have bad roles where maybe you go for like a fast Imperial and maybe you just go Imperial and you, you make a whole bunch of cataphracts and then you, you build 10 and then there's none that pop out. Or then there's going to be those team games where it's like you're filling up your last five slots and you get five in a row. So it, it's one of those RNG landmarks. So, but at the same time, if we just assume that for every one that you train, um, you get, you get a, you know, a, a third of it for free, we can then judge it based on that. And it, it's always hard to know uh, because it's going to be dependent on your economy. It's going to be dependent on how much you're fighting, depending on, on how much value you're going to be able to pull from this landmark. But I think where this landmark will find value is going to be in team games. I think that having additional cataphracts is going to be so important. So when it comes to team games, cavalry is obviously very important. Um, and the fact that you can have more cavalry, which means more influence around the map, this is one of the this is one of the things that synergizes again well with the Imperial Hippodrome. The more cavalry you've got, then the more mobility you've got. But I think for one v ones, this landmark definitely underwhelming um, compared to its its uh, the alternative. But that's until we reach the trade meta. And if we do reach the trade meta, so the the main thing is not going to be the Lamentani. It's not going to be the Varangian Guard. It's going to be the Cataphract. Because if we take a look, I know the Varangian Guard's got a pretty decent uh, pretty decent gold cost. 90 40 so slightly over two to one uh, and then compare that to the uh compare that to the cataphract which is basically one for one at that stage what is it six to five um which means that you're going to be wanting to make as many cataphracts as you can if you're doing trade just because they're very gold heavy uh, and that that's where you're going to be doing a lot so i, I think for uh, depending on the way that it goes the palatine school could look pretty good in the future but we'll, we'll keep it in the b tier for now
All right, so moving on to Juicy's Legacy. And boy, oh boy, have we got some good landmarks to talk about here. I tell you what, I can't believe we're putting so many of these in the, the S tier. But it's just going to keep going. I mean, I don't need to explain this one to you guys much. It's the Meditation Gardens. It generates resources based on the, the uh, resources that are around it. It's absolutely broken. Completely broken. Uh, I've seen... I think my record with this landmark is like 180 resources a minute coming in, which is nice, but I'm sure there's going to be better. Uh, I'm expecting a lot of Reddit posts. I, I want to see people posting more on Reddit about this landmark because this is one of those landmarks where it's like you could get something absolutely insane. It just... It scales like crazy. Definitely going to be nerfed. Um, let's just put it that way. Uh, <laughs> next up... Uh, well, let's talk about it a little bit though. Uh, one of the big things that you want to do with the the um, with Juicy's Legacy is at, at the moment for me the main two uh, strategies are Fast Castle, and and that's just off one landmark which is the Meditation Gardens, and you need a lot of food for that. And this landmark's very good with food because you just put it on berries. Sometimes you get berry patches that spawn too close together, and you get yourself an absolutely beautiful landmark with like a hundred food a minute coming in. On the other to on the other side, you've got Two TC Song Dynasty, which is absolutely lovely again because if you, if you get a big food uh, income from this then you're just going to be able to support that on top of that you can do things like uh double stone if you find a double stone chucking this on it and you've got yourself a town center after five minutes it's really really nice uh, you, you can throw it on double stone just play heavy feudal and then you'll add in your second tc for free lovely stuff all right next landmark uh once again this is going to be the Xiangnan tower uh so this landmark allows or well not allows but every time you build a military production building you're going to receive a unit. So you build an archery range, you get a Jugunu, uh, you, you build a barracks, you get a spearman, you build a uh, stable, you get a horseman. So it's kind of like a rebate in, in that regard, but you don't get to control what you what you have. So if you're Castle Age, you're still going to get a horseman, you're not going to get a knight, um, you're not going to get a palace guard instead of a spearman. So in, in that regard, it's, it's reasonable. But I, I think that initially when this landmark came out, I was like, this is just utter trash. Now I've kind of come around to it. I definitely don't think it's anywhere near as strong as the Meditation Gardens, but I do think this is a good landmark because it covers that weakness that China has, or sorry, not China, uh, Juicy's Legacy has that, you know, you go Song Dynasty and then you go for the second TC and you're five minutes into the game and now your enemy's going to start pushing you with units at the sixth minute and you haven't made a unit yet. And so you build a barracks and there's your unit. <laughs> it's such a silly, such a silly sieve at the moment. I, I can't wait. I, I, I swear this, this sieve is crazy. Um, the other thing to note is, and this is like the lesser known fact, is it also acts as a tax drop-off location. There you go. Um, yeah, I, I don't really uh, consider it that high. Uh, so look, I'm, I'm going to be... There's a part of me that wants to stick this in C tier, but then there's a part of me that kind of understands that, you know, it, it plays an important part in, in the role of the Chinese. So look, we're going to stick it safe and, and chuck it in the B tier uh, where it is pretty decent. All right, next up, we've got the Shaolin Monastery coming in. This is a landmark that allows you to produce the Shaolin Monk. It's in the Castle Age. And this landmark is... I, I feel like it's, it's a little bit underused at the moment, but it'll take a while for the Bald Man strategy to catch on. I saw Beastie did a video on the Bald Man strategy as well. That was, uh, that was beautiful to watch. These units are incredible. And they synergize incredibly well with, with the Chinese... with the, the juicy uh, legacy civilization. So it costs 200 food for these units. And one of the things to note is that once you get Song Dynasty, so if we have a look here, Song Dynasty, your buildings, the cost of them are reduced, including your farm, which means that because you've got cheaper farms, you've got more farms. And because you've got more farms, you've got more food. And because you've got more food, you can afford to buy Shaolin Monks. So they don't cost gold. And that's really, really nice. The other thing is that these, these guys just absolutely destroy anything. Uh, I saw a, a cool YouTube comment um, about, about an hour or two ago and it said I had an interesting game with Shaolin Monk I went to do a walla lol and then I, I popped my uh, ranged defensive uh, um, or ra ranged defensive bonus beforehand and m the enemy tried to snipe my Shaolin Monk and he couldn't kill it in time so I converted all of his units and I was like that, that's actually really smart because you've got 170 base health but then it goes up to 340 and then the enemy thinks they can snipe it but they can't. And so people are going to have to learn to calculate that and like, can I do it? Can I not do it? That sort of thing. Uh, so, th I mean, that's one of the, the lesser important things. But I guess for me, the big thing is that when it comes to this landmark, it's not necessarily about the fact that it unlocks the monk for you, but it's about the speed with which you can get such a powerful unit out onto the map. At the moment, fast castle times are about 5 minutes and 40 seconds, 5 minutes and 45 seconds with the Juicy Legacy. You can get Shaolin monks out very, very quickly. 
and because of that you can have pretty decent control over the relics the other thing is it can't be um it can't be converted so if your enemy gets to the relic before you you can kill them and then take the relic and they can't convert you to try and like defend themselves uh so that's the other thing to note they can all they like th this guy is so strong he can kill a gilded horseman 1v1 easily and then he can heal himself up so i i think because of that it's a it's a very decent landmark i'm gonna put it in the a tier i like it a lot uh, and it's definitely my favorite. It's definitely my go-to. Next up, we've got Montlou's Academy, which is the landmark that allows Juicy Legacy to buff up all of their Imperial officials. This landmark, I'm not really a fan of. Once again, it's one of those landmarks that serves a purpose, right? It gets you to um, Yuan Dynasty. Uh, but when it comes to the upgrades, there's look, the upgrades are good. Now, it's going to go in the C tier just because the upgrades are good. They're not great. Uh, and it's a very fine line, right? You can't really make them great because if you made them great, then you, you've got trouble because Juicy is already very powerful. Uh, but for me, the, the main one is just the fact that you have got uh, the movement speed, single whip reforms, because your Imperial officials are now moving faster. So j just to explain it, uh, let's, let's, get, let's get out paint here just to explain how this works. Uh, so if you've got a town center here and you've got a barracks over here and you've got your, let's say you've got a whole bunch of barracks here and this is a mill and you've got your little dude He's running around. That's not his color. He's what color is he? He's red. And we're gonna we're gonna put him in paint as well. Let's let's paint him as well. Uh, and let's uh now let's grab him. Where's my grab button? There it is. All right. And we want to make sure that we have transparent selection turned on. That's not what I wanted to do. But anyway, look. So this is him running around. So what's gonna happen is he's chilling out at the town center. He's just just dropped off gold. And now he's decided he's going to go over to this barracks. And when he goes over to this barracks, what that does is it locks out that barracks. So that barracks. Oh my god, where did it go? Oh my god, there he is. Anyway, we're just going to grab him from here. Uh, he, he's going to run over to this barracks. And when he runs over to this barracks, it locks out this barracks so that no one else can collect gold from it. And because of that, walking time becomes a really interesting mechanic. Because the faster that you walk, then the faster you're going to take the tax off it. It's basically just when it comes down to the efficiency of the economy. This is a really key upgrade for this uh, this particular unit and the way that it functions. So I, th I think overall that this is a really nice upgrade to have, the single whip reform. But at the same time, I don't think it's worth like the, the whole landmark itself. I guess the other fact is that Imperial officials um, also collect 20% off their taxes as food, which is nice. But at the same time, you know, the same thing that we mentioned before, you've got Song Dynasty, which reduces the cost of your granary, reduces the cost of your farm. So now you've got this booming, you know, food economy. So it doesn't really, like if this was wood, I'd be all about that. Or if this was stone, I'd be like, yeah, this is great. You want to get this, but it's not. And that kind of hurts. I guess the other thing is it also reduces the time um, it takes for your buildings to be on, on cooldown. Uh, so instead of being 15 seconds, it comes down to seven seconds, which is quite nice. Um, but... Yeah, re realistically, I, I, I'm not a big fan of this landmark, and I only build it if I have to. Uh, normally, I'm just going to be looking to go to Castle Age uh, with the Shaolin uh, Monastery, and then after that, I'll look to go into Imperial Age, and I'll, I'll hit Ming Dynasty without going through to this landmark quite often. All right, well, speaking of Ming Dynasty, let's talk about our Imperial Age landmarks. We've got two of them. We've got the Temple of the Sun, and we've got Juicy's Library. Which one are we going to look at first? I feel like we could probably look at the Temple of the Sun because I haven't really decided on where I want to put these two landmarks. So the Temple of the Sun is a landmark that is unique in that it allows you to choose a bonus that you would like and th that bonus would affect specific units. There's four different bonuses that you can choose from. You can choose to increase the... Um, oh, it doesn't actually say. Uh, so you can in in choose to increase the damage of cavalry the range of gunpowder units, the speed of infantry, or you can give all of your units that are out of combat health regeneration. And you can only have one at a time. It's a toggle. Um, but it doesn't cost anything to switch, and uh, it's on all the time as long as the landmark's alive. There's some really powerful bonuses in there. For team games, if you're going full cavalry, extra 20% damage. That's massive. For... 1v1 games, you got a, you got infantry out, you got a whole bunch of spears and some crossbows. Boom. Extra 15% movement speed. Maybe you, maybe you go on Grenadiers. Get an extra bit of range in there for you as well. This landmark also allows you to get up to 11 range on bombards, which has me reminiscing about the good old days of Chinese 12 range bombards. But there's nothing here that really stands out to me. There's nothing here that stands out and says, this is broken. You should have this. This isn't like the Taganashin the Gunsmith, it, where you know I've I've got instant production of two hundred and forty resource units every thirty seconds. It's not like that. It, it to me, it's like it, what you're getting is not 
you, you can't really put a value on it. But at the same time, because you can't really put a value on it, it's hard to gauge how valuable it is. And it's because of that, I, I, I feel like, look, if, if I had to choose between these... See, the thing is, you can't even choose between the two landmarks, right? Because it's it's uh, you, you, it's Chinese, right? The Juicy Legacy. You, you can you can have both of them. Um, so I, I, I'm kind of like trending. I'm, I'm thinking mainly towards the A tier. It, it's going to be a low A tier, maybe towards a B tier. Uh, that would probably be where, where it would be. Um, and th that would just mainly be because the infantry speed is very nice to have. And it does give you quite a bit of flexibility as well. Uh, with with your health regen or you know whether you want to switch into cavalry so I, I think from that aspect it's good and then finally juicy's library juicy's library unlocks unique technologies for the juicy legacy there's five technologies you can choose from one of them you should never choose the other four well it's up to you whether you want to choose them uh so I, I, overall i would say that there's one that you always choose one that you never choose and then you can choose between the other three so the one that you always choose dynastic protectors allows the production of unique cavalry units the imperial guard and the yuan raider the imperial guard is the strongest cavalry unit in the game uh with the exception of the cataphract if it's getting buffed up by um the hippodrome triumph ability but anyone who's actually microing or just you know if i see triumph i'm just gonna run away i'm not i'm not gonna fight you uh unless you're in my base killing my dudes in which case i have to fight you so well played um so that's the one that you always get the one that you never get is advanced administration which is, increases the health of imperial officials by 150 and their maximum gold increase by 80 and also increases the amount that you can have by two just not worth it, it to be honest if i was the devs i would move this upgrade right here uh, and I would put it in the Montlou Academy, but I would make it so that it only becomes available at the Imperial Age. That's how I would do it. Just because this, I, I, I genuinely think this is never going to get picked outside of like comp stomp games. That, that's the only time it'll get picked. And then finally, we've got the, uh, the three technologies that you can choose from. Um, you know, you've cho chosen your dynastic protectors. Now you can pick Cloud of Terror for, for area of effect on your bombards. 10,000 bolts for an extra bolt for crossbows and juganu and roar of the dragon which gives fire lances to your spears and your horsemen so three unique cool technologies there i think just s simply from the fact that it unlocks dynastic or that it has dynastic protectors makes you see library incredible the other thing to note is that this costs the same amount of resources to upgrade an elite unit so if we go look at the stable as an example, and I want to, I, I want to get elite lances. Doesn't say the cost, but I can tell you now it costs the same amount of resources uh, to research dynastic protectors. But the Imperial Guard don't need any upgrade. So once you've got them, you've got an elite unit, and it's the same with the Yuan Radar. So you've, you're essentially paying like a two for one to unlock the elite status for two units, and they're both really cool. Yuan Radar obviously a very good raiding unit as well. Uh, quite micro intensive though, so probably not going to be the focus of ma most people. That most main, mainly go into the Imperial Guard. Uh, and then finally, we've got the, um, yeah, I, I mean, we, we've talked about everything. So I, I guess realistically, overall, if I was going to give this a rating, it's probably going to be in the A tier as well, um, just because it doesn't really jump out to me as being, you know, overly strong. Uh, but at the same time, there's nothing in there. Like, it's still a, a very good landmark. All right. Next up, we have got the Order of the Dragon. Now, even though the Order of the Dragon have got access to six landmarks, three of them are the same three of them are different so i've only put the three different ones on here because look i know that you guys love the regnitz cathedral but at the end of the day it, it does the exact same thing that it's always done you know how it works you know how it functions let's talk about the other ones so starting off we're, we're gonna we're not even gonna start off with the mine work we're gonna start off with the ark and chapel it's d tier this landmark is terrible don't build it it's so bad why is it bad great question let's compare the pair okay let's take a look at the Arkan chapel for the order of the dragon and then the Arkan chapel for the holy roman empire and i know that you're going to say well you can't compare some people are going to say you can't compare these it's like comparing apples and oranges but at the end of the day i'm comparing Arkans and Arkans. all right so bear with me Arkan chapel for the order of the dragon provides a 10 cent 10 percent bonus to all villagers in the radius Acts as a drop-off point. No prelate needed. No prelate needed. Wonderful. Wow. Thanks. No prelate needed for that. 10%. Oh, 10%. How much? I'm just, just curious. Um, how much does a uh, how much does a mining camp upgrade give you? 15%. Oh, 15%. And that's that's 10%. Oh. Mm. And it's in the radius? Yep. And the radius is the same as the other Arkan Chapel? Yep. And how much does the other Arkan Chapel give? Um, it inspires units in a large radius so long as a prelate is garrisoned. So that that's like the caveat. Uh, and it also acts as a drop-off point. Yeah, but what's the percentage, though? 
Uh, well, let, let's check. Uh, prelate uh, Inspire. It doesn't really say. Maybe does it say over here how much a Prelate Inspire's uh, unique unit? Uh, use the Holy Inspiration ability on villagers, increasing their gather rate by 40% for 30 seconds. Yeah, that's right. 40% for this Ark and Chapel versus 10% for this one. I'm sorry, but in what world do you think that that's fair? Now, don't get me... Like, okay, we're obviously comparing apples and oranges here because this Ark and Chapel has bigger, stronger villages. But at the end of the day, I have bigger, stronger villages with a minework palace as well and an Ark and Chapel. So, look, obviously we don't want to give them 40% on top of this, but 10%, it just ain't going to cut it. This, this needs a buff. There's no way anyone's going Ark and outside of a person who doesn't have the ability to read and has gone, oh, that seems pretty bad. Uh, so, there you go. Arkham Chapel, D tier, don't build it. Mindwork. Actually, not a bad version of the Mindwork. I really don't mind this version of the Mindwork. I think it's quite powerful. Uh, in particular, Bodkin Bolts, one of my favorite upgrades, allows your crossbows to deal as, or to, to act as Springholds. Now, that is until you get this upgrade in the Imperial Age at the, uni at, at the university. Yes, at the university, Siegeworks. So, it increases the ranged armor of uh, Siege units by 10. That will actually counter that pretty effectively. Uh, but until that upgrade comes through, your crossbows will absolutely shrek mangonels spring Ords, all that good stuff so that's a cool little upgrade uh the other thing is you've got access to zornhau um which allows your lance connected to provide a bleed damage this is really good on villager lines because quite often you'll run up to the villager line with a lance connect and you'll swing and all of a sudden those villagers will get away and you're crying ah come back here but then they die on the ground because you've got zornhau that's the other thing and then finally we've got golden crass which i am slowly coming around to um someone gave me a little bit of they, they said drongo you need to do the math on this and so you know what i'm, I'm just going to quickly do the math on it for the order of the dragon here we're going to jump in and, and do as quickly as we can right now uh give me a second here but essentially they said look it might not seem like a lot but over the course of a fight this is really going to start to add up because you're taking 20 percent of 20 percent is four percent uh but you got to remember that that that's not the only thing that they've got going on they've got the access to things like heals as well so if we go in a jiff here and we're just going to lay down some uh, elite. Let's get our men at arms out right here and put our elves back down. So you, it, it starts off at 230 health, our men at arms. So that means that if we've got a gilded men at arms, 20% health... Uh, so sorry. Gilded men at arms who fall below 20% health take 20% less damage, which is like 4% of your health pool. But when you actually math that out, and if we go, so 230 divided by, uh, what is it, divided by 5? So 46. So everything below 46, uh, you're having, yeah, uh, sorry, <laughs> everything below 46, you're getting slightly less damage. So you could even say that that's like an extra 9.2 damage. But now when you get upgrades on top of that, so if, if we throw in just a, a couple of extra upgrades, maybe we get Elite Army Tactics in here as well, all of a sudden that's 408. And then... If you go 408 divided by 5, that, that's your 20%. And then we divide that by 5. Now you're talking an extra 16 health per minute arms. Like, that's not that bad. And then when you combine the fact that you've got armor as well, and you can get some pretty decent numbers when it comes to armor. Uh, and let's get that crass in as well. So now we've got 8 armor on this, which means that you're effectively taking less damage together with the armor. And then finally, if you have a... I thought that, that was a, a monastery. It was not a monastery. It looks like a monastery, though. And if you have a prelate out, and that prelate happens uh, to be inspiring people with its inspired warriors, then you've got a little bit more armor. And on top of that, if it gets low, then you can heal it back up. So maybe it'll be the difference between life and death. I think it's a it's an okay argument to make, but I, I still think like it's, it's on the weaker side, this upgrade. So look, overall, when it comes to the mine work, it's the more solid choice that you've got from the order of the dragon than the arkan and that sucks because it's only a bt a landmark but hey what can you do not too bad anyway next up we've got the order of the dragons burgrave palace now this is a little bit different from the burgrave of the holy roman empire and that is because you should always be making units with this now i've done the math on this it works out once you've got three relics um that it, it breaks even and once you've got four relics then you start losing um on it so if, if basically the way that it works is if you've got a, if if you think you can take four of the relics go to the regnant's cathedral if you think you can only get three of the relics it's up to you 
if you, you're only going to get two relics or one relic, then definitely go for this landmark all the time because then you can remember that you're always going to be generating gold from those relics. But basically, it just reduces the cost of units and trains them slightly faster. It does force you down a route though. Let's say you wanted to play archers. Well, now you can't play only archers or archer cav. Now you can't play on only archer cav. You have to base your strategy around this as well. So it means that you're going to be making spears, men at arms or lands to connect there for the entirety of the game. Otherwise, you just lose value on this landmark. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. But I'm a big fan of it. I think it's pretty decent. I'm going to put it in the A tier. Uh, I, I like this a lot. And it, it definitely gives more flexibility to the to the Order of the Dragon, rather, on maps that aren't forgiving or matchups that aren't forgiving. Those matchups where you do get denied the relics. Those matchups where you, you haven't been fortunate in spawns. That's essentially it. All right. So that's it for the Order of the Dragon. Nice and quick. Let's talk about the A bids. This one is going to be... I don't know how to say it. It's going to be weird. All right, let's do it. So the Aeobids have got eight different age ups. These age ups scale throughout the entirety of the game. So the longer you save it, the more you get from it, which means that if you want 300 wood, then you can take your industry in the Dark Age to go to Feudal. But if you prefer 2,500 wood, you can take it going to Imperial Age and get yourself a whole bunch more wood. And that scales for every single one of these things now each one of these is powerful at a certain point in time as an example you might say oh you know like the the economic wing growth it's it's, it's really good yeah it's really good except it's not really good in imperial age why well because i've already got 167 villages i don't need 10 more the 10 percent work rate is nice but there's other things that are better and because of that it's kind of hard to judge where these sit because depending on what point you're at in the game depends on what point these are going to be good so uh, as i said before so economic wing growth this this is great early on this is definitely a viable uh, option for you early on whereas late game it's not going to be so i think what we're going to do is just try and take it from our most viable point in the game and then make an assessment based on that and hopefully we don't end up with all of them in s tier uh so that that would be pretty much it all right, so we're going to start off with, and we're just going to go down uh, the list in here. That way we can actually see everything. So we're going to start off with Culture Wing Advancement. That is this bad boy right here. So we'll bring it to the front. Uh, and what do we got after that? Culture Wing Logistics after that. I think it's this guy with a healing. And then Economic Wing Growth. Actually, no, that's Economic Wing Growth. And then we've got the wood. And then we've got Trade Wing Bazaar. And then we've got the military one. And then we've got Camels and Camels. No, we've got the military one down here. Hold on, camels. Oh, gosh. Military one at the end here. And then we've got the two camels. All right, there we go. So now, now I know which ones we've got and where they need to be. So culture wing advancement. So this wing allows you to age up fast. It also allows you to age up cheaper, which is cool. And it's niche. There is basically one circumstance where this is good. And that's if you're on a water map. If you're on a water map, this is really good because it means that you can invest heavily in the water early on and then when you need to click up, bang, click it, get up faster than your opponent. Remember that you age up faster as well and it costs less. And because you're it, because it costs less, you're clicking the button sooner, which means that realistically you're it, it, like the difference between aging up with this culture wing versus this culture wing is significant, right? So it's an extra, God, look at the difference. It's an extra 42 seconds for this one. But then all of the time that it takes to collect the resources, it's probably going to take you what, another 30 seconds? Another, maybe another 40 seconds? Uh, at, at least. So it's a saving of a, a ridiculous amount of time, right? Like m maybe close to 90 seconds. Let's call it 90 seconds that you're saving. When it comes to water maps, that is so important. If you can get to the enemy dock with a unit before they've got any units out, you're at a massive advantage. And it's because of that, I think culture wing advancement is particularly good when it comes to water maps. The fact that it is niche means that it, does it i can't give it a high rating just simply because it's niche and you're not going to be using it all the time especially even in the current map pool right like if we take a look at the rank map pool at the moment there's four water maps if i remember correctly so if you if you're playing the aubids and you like playing water then by all means like downvote cliffside dry arabia golden pit like get them out of here you've only got canal himayama rocky river and golden heights and you can like smash those out and then you've only got gorge and hidden valley that you got to deal with um so discard changes definitely um, so definitely like you could play around that style, but I, I think realistically 
Uh, it, it's got to go in in B tier just because of it. You know what? I'm going to put it in A tier just because it is so impactful on, on water maps. And there, there's four water maps now in the current map pool. All right, let's get back over to our learning page here for the ABIDs and go down. So next up, we've got the Culture Wing Logistics, which is going to provide you Dervish, uh, which are the unique healing unit for the, uh, the ABIDs. Now, with this unit, it has the ability to, to do a mass heal um, and it, it's a something that only can be used um, on and off. Whereas if you go for the Imperial upgrade, it, it's on permanently. That's one thing to note. Now, another thing is that... So if we talk about the most viable use of this that I've seen so far, it's not particularly useful in the, um, in the Feudal Age because you can't capture the Sacred Sites and you can't pick up the Relics. It's basically like your two Imams from the... Um, from the Ottomans. The only difference is the Ottomans get a really nice bonus, which heals everything. Uh, whereas here, you've just got healing by 25%. But I mean, you're getting a unit that heals everything, but you already have that anyway, just by building the Dervish. So it's not like you're getting something new from that. Uh, the main usage I've seen from this was uh, from Beastie, where he used it going to the Castle Age. So I think he opened up with the Trade Wing Bazaar and then went into Culture Wing Logistics. And then, so as soon as he aged up, he had three Dervish ready to go. Like you age up and then boom, literally out of the gate, you've got three... Uh, ready to go and pick up relics. That was it. I don't think it's that strong. I think there's there's stronger things that you could get, uh, and realistically, it doesn't seem particularly good. I think for, for the late game, having you know, there's something to be said about having it on permanently, but the heal's not significant. It's nice to have, but it's it's yeah, it's really not that big. Uh, and because of that, I'm going to justify just throwing it in the C tier. All right. So next up, we've got economic wing growth. I think this is probably best used uh, going to feudal age. I think this is quite strong. If you were to compare it to say economic wing industry, uh, economic wing industry is about speed. So you can get a town center down on the four minute mark here. Uh, with economic wing growth, you can still get a town center down pretty quickly. Uh, the main difference is that you have three villagers uh, over the top of it. So it, it's probably about 60 seconds of difference between industry and economic growth. The only difference is then, so you'd still have those three villagers. The only difference is now that you gain 50 additional food on your orchards. Uh, and you, your TC came up a little bit slower. So let's say you're up against like the French or the English and you want to get your TC up, you'd go for economic wing uh, industry, whereas economic wing growth would be if you're up in a, in a passive matchup and you, and you want to go for that. Uh, so overall, I, I would say that the economic wing growth probably sits in the A tier and then the economic wing industry in the B tier. All right. Uh, now, I, I will also just provide the caveat that um, in Age of Empires 3, this age up was by far the strongest age up that there was. That's a completely different game. So we'll have to wait and see how it plays out. Trade Wing Bazaar. S tier. All right. Uh, what do we got else? Uh, uh, Trade Wing Advisors. Um, game. <laughs> so, I mean, you guys all know what this landmark does. This is just broken. It, it, it's so silly. Uh, I, I read a comment from Beastie today. We've got a Discord server and uh, that, that we're a part of. And uh, he said, what did he say? I, I rolled five... <laughs> five military rolls and just bought out all the military and just killed the guy instantly <laughs> like something along those lines and i was like that just sounds like a perfectly balanced landmark like you immediately hit castle age you just buy 25 units and you just kill his you just kill him instantly like and the thing is okay that's overpowered but at the same time it's a bit of there's a bit of rng involved right but the fact is it can still happen and it doesn't feel good and it's it's just it's like a, it's a gift that keeps on giving because you know even if you get late game you can still get favorable trades with stone you're able to buy villages the whole way through if you get if you get unlucky and get traders i mean you still got traders it's not that bad right like shit they they, they do two trades and they've paid themselves off anyway so it's it's really good it's really really good all right next up we've got the trade wing advisors this is going to be your adabegs which give you a little bit of health on your military production buildings uh, I think you can have up up to two, whereas here you get four, and then here you get seven. Um, so, it, I, th I think it's only ever a max of of that as well. I don't think you can train more than that. I, I, you, can I just, let's let's double check right now? I just want to make sure I'm not telling porkies, uh, which is, is what in Australia we call lies. Um, it's another word for it, you know. My mum would always say, "You're not telling me a porky, are you?" So I'm just curious to see if I can make more utter bags, like it, whether that sets my limit for the rest of the game. Because if it doesn't, then there's... I mean, there's not much incentive in taking it late other than just having What's no that? other option, right? So if we go... Let's get this bad boy on. Uh -huh. All right, so... We do that, so... Yeah, Atabeg limit is reached. So if I put these guys in... 
over here. I wonder, do they still count if I put them in the building? No, they don't count for mil for population. That's cool. Yeah, see? So I'm, I'm at the Atabeg limit. So I can only ever be making, you know, spearmen with extra health out of these two barracks. Every other one, it's just, you know, it's not going to be there. But just remember that if, if that gets deleted or destroyed, then I can make another Atabeg. But I can never go more than two. And they do have the ability to supervise. That, that's, that, that's that ability. Okay, cool. So... Interesting ability. Like, ob obviously, it's really nice um, to have that ability. I'd prefer if they scaled this a little bit differently, though. I'd be more tempted to be like, uh, when it comes to balance, and I know, I know we shouldn't be talking about balance and, and all that kind of stuff or, like, uh, ideas, but in instead of that, you know, what if they did it so that it was... Uh, where are we? Trade wing advisors. So, like, 15% health on the first one, and you can you gain two Atabegs, but you can have as many as you like. And your second one is 20% health and four Atabegs, and you, but you can make as many as you like. And then the final one is seven Atabegs with 25% health, and you can make as many as you like. I feel like that would be a better approach. And because Atabegs are still expensive, if I remember correctly, like you, you can build them. Yeah, you can build, you can train them for, I think it's 100, 100, 100 wood, 100, 100 food, 100 gold. So they're still expensive. Um, but it, it'd just be nice to be able to do that and not have to, like, it would make it a lot more viable. I feel like it's not really viable at the moment just because, well, yeah, it, it just it, it's it's nice having the twenty percent, but people these days they don't they don't want twenty percent. They they want give me give me units now, baby. That's that's what they want. Um, so look, I, I think it's decent, but we're gonna throw it in the C tier just because I don't think it's particularly uh, viable. All right, last up, we've got the military wings. So the first one is gonna be military wing reinforcement. Second one's gonna be master smiths. Let's talk about master smiths just quickly because I know where this is gonna go, and. I know Kenoki isn't going to like this because Kenoki is a big fan of this. And I'm going to tell you why I don't like it. Military Wing Master Smiths unlocks all of the technologies at a certain level for free. So, what that means is that... Or th that's, a, that's at a blacksmith. So that means that if I use this to age up, I get all of my technologies in the feudal age for free. If I use it to age up a castle age, I get all of my castle age techs for free. And if I get it at imperial age, I get all my imperial age techs for free. And Kanoki said to me, Drongo, this is a great age up because it gives you a huge amount of value. And I said, yeah, it gives you a huge amount of value. But you've got to remember that with this value that it's giving you, that not every one of these technologies is going to be relevant to you. Let's say that you're playing a an archer game. You're only looking for an upgrade that gives you range damage and ranged defense. Maybe you're not interested in melee attack. By the same token, maybe you're playing a melee game. Maybe you're only interested in, in you know, not, not having ranged attack. So that's the first thing. So you're going to lose value on that. And on top of that, the value that you're gaining here is incremental in that it's very easy to justify early on spending resources on a blacksmith and on one upgrade. And then getting the second one or getting the third one or getting the fourth one when it when I'm, when I'm ready for it or when I... I need it rather than just like getting it right now. Like sure, it's good right now, but I can't justify it. I can't afford it. If you were to compare that to say something like the wood, like the industry, where it's like this 300 wood is coming in right now and, and you're getting it now, that's immediate value that you're getting just straight away. Whereas this is not immediate value that you're getting. And because of that, even though you are getting the technologies, you're not getting value out of those technologies. And that's the reason why I don't think it's good. And because of that, I'm putting it in the detail. Next up, we've got Military Wing Reinforcement. This one's a bit interesting. I do like this. So the House of Wisdom will produce your Desert Raiders depending on uh, every two minutes of the game, depending on what age you go up with this. So if you do it in the in the Feudal Age or to the Feudal Age, you're only going to get one every two minutes. Whereas to the Castle Age, it's three every two minutes. And then Imperial Age, seven every two minutes. This is, this is pretty good, right? I saw this and I'm like, this is actually really good for late game because these units, well, first and foremost, like these units absolutely fuck um but second of all seven units is a lot and that's free units that you're getting where you can allocate those that population space instead of to villages that had to make those seven units you can just have like more military units so it's very nice in that aspect but again it's a, it's going to be about like finding the right pathway and which direction you go it's it's still one of those things where i don't think there's a very clear solid route for it i think trade wing bazaar is going to be really strong 
whether it is feudal or castle. I don't think it's going to be worth going imperial because you're, you're just wasting too much time, right? Unless you're going fast imperial into this, <laughs> don't bother. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that the military wing reinforcement, I think this is definitely got a place. Um, and I think that this, this will probably end up being quite a, a decent age up for those late game situations. I'm throwing up whether it deserves to be in the B tier or whether it can go to the A tier, but I'm just going to throw it in the B tier now just to balance it out. You know, I don't want to stick too many in the A tier, that kind of kind of thing, but we're going to leave it there. Overall, I'm pretty happy with how this looks. It makes a lot of sense. Most of the sieves have got good landmarks. Uh, some of the sieves have got a lot of good landmarks, uh, like uh, well, I, I guess the, uh, the Juicy Legacy have got a lot of good landmarks. Uh, but, I mean, realistically, like, if we look at the Japanese, they've got three really good landmarks that they can go every single game, uh, and it's the same thing for the Byzantines. So, they've got, you know, th there's no one getting shafted here. It's not like Chinese, the Chinese are on, uh, on, on season one or season two where all their landmarks were terrible. Like, the only thing you had going for you was, like, the astronomical clock tower that could be supervised. That was it. That was the only thing that the Chinese had going for them back then. Uh, but, yeah, we'll leave it there. If you've got any questions, let me know. If you disagree, that's okay. Let me know as well. And uh, if you made it to the end, let me know. Give me a little wink in the comments and uh, I'll wink back for you. Anyway, I'll catch you in the next one. Thank you for watching.